Faith is a substance of hope. Faith is confidence in the unseen, the unheard of, and the never before. Faith is the acceptance of the absurd. But faith requires more than belief. Faith is action. To claim a belief with our words but not with our lives is a lie. Faith is a reaction. How we respond when we're told that we are fools. Faith is a journey, and every journey begins with a step. A year ago, from this November, we had a Compassion Sunday for the first time working with Compassion International. And as a church, we had a worship service where we gathered together. Uh, we, um, we just made a pitch to the church saying, would you be willing to sponsor these kids and change their lives? And the church just stepped up and it was amazing. 520 something just that Sunday that, that took a packet and sponsored a kid. And a vast majority of them were in Colombia and we were able to launch a child development center in Cincinnati, Colombia through it. I wanted to go on a trip to see my sponsored child. Um, ever since two summers ago, I met a young lady um, who used to be a compassion child and was rescued out of poverty. I saw the impact that compassion had on her life. So I wanted my child to know that um, she was loved, like my friend knew that she was loved. We got to do home visits for some of the children and when they told me that my child was one of the homes we were gonna visit, I got really nervous. And when we finally got to her house, it was on the very edge of the neighborhood and dirt floors, tin roof, and just sticks and tarp for walls. And it was um, just a very humbling experience. Um, just kind of put life to the letters that she'd been writing me and I'd been writing her. And I just felt so much love and joy from meeting her and at the same time was just I was just so heartbroken by you know that's what she lived in. So the first day that we were at the center I got to go visit my child's home um, but I was really nervous going into the home visit because um, because I love this girl a lot and I wanted her to know that. It was good for me to see because it opened up my eyes to where she lives and what her home situation is like and so that, that was really sweet. I really enjoyed seeing her world and I was so thankful that her family let me into her world for just a little bit. Um, that, that meant a lot to me. So one of the, the great things about Compassion is that they give us an opportunity, if at all possible, to actually go visit the home of the kids that we sponsor. And it was interesting to see the discrepancy between just the four homes of the, of the same kids that go to the same center. Uh, my youngest one, little Andrea, she had a, it was just a little um, bitty hut of a home stacked up next to others and all of them lived and there were like six or seven kids, just the parents and kids shoved in those couple little beds put together. And my, my heart broke to see this little girl that I love, that I write to, that I, I'm concerned about living in that kind of situation. But that was her reality and the majority of people's reality every single day in Cincinnati. So it was really hard to say bye to my child. I would, she would come up and hug me and say bye and then she would run off and then she would run back up and hug me again. And so that was really difficult. But one of the most difficult things was leaving the church staff. Before we left the church staff, we asked them, how can we pray for you? And one of the things that they said is that, please pray that we would continue to press on, that we would not give up. Months before the trip, um, I actually just wondered if I was supposed to go or considered backing out of the trip. Prayerfully sought God's guidance on that, and I just kept feeling like he was telling me to go, that I still needed to go, that he would take care of everything here. Um, I'm so thankful I did because I was so blessed by the trip and it was such an amazing experience. I've never gone on a mission trip where I haven't come back changed, where I haven't discovered something new about God. And this trip was no different. And I, I want to say that to you. you know, I want to challenge you to go on a mission trip. It doesn't matter if you've been on one before, it doesn't matter if you've never been on one. I want to challenge you to go on another one because it will change your life.
there's something about mission trips that helps you go deeper than you've ever gone before. And so uh, as you pray through this, as you consider what God is asking you to do, I want to challenge you. Think about a mission trip. Think about how giving up just one week of your life could change the rest of your, of your life. If you will, I know you'll discover the beauty and the depth of God around the world. I think it was an experience well worth it. It takes some, a little bit of sacrifice, but to be able to bond with people, to know that there's Christian brothers and sisters out there that care about other people other than themselves, it was wonderful. It's not just about writing the letters and sending a check every month, but it has um, changed our lives because we've met them face to face. It is such an experience that you not only make in the life of the child, but you also it's a life-changing experience for yourself as well. Arlington Life Shelter is more than just a bed and a meal for someone. My name is Chandra Thompson. I'm the Director of Volunteer Services here at the Arlington Life Shelter. I work with faith communities, civic clubs here at the shelter to uh, assist us in meeting the needs of those who come in for help. I can remember one day sitting in my office and one of our resident assistants came in and shared you have to see Shandra, you need to come back and see what one of our moms has done. So I walked back into one of the family dorms and there was this line that was connected to two of the bunk beds. And she had her kids clothing on that line and a, and a pair of her pants and wanted and hoping that they would be dry for the next morning. We only have one commercial dryer and that's a double stack dryer. And we have over 80 people that are using that dryer, those two dryers, and there is no way that everyone in here can have their things you know, prepared and dried for the next day or even for the next, you know, for the week, the next couple of days. As a mom myself and not being able to have clean clothes for your kids, not being able to have them prepared and ready for them for the, their school day, you know, that kind of bothered me. A group from Fielder Church had came in and did a project and I, re I remember a lot of those husband and wives and individuals that came in during that time, they, they had a connection here. A lot of them shared with me that, you know, Chandra, something happens there. If you need help with something, reach out to us, please do. So I had uh, Pastor Rurik and uh, Pastor Pickering uh, information. So I thought, you know, I'd give them a call and, you know, share with them what we were going through, what, what the critical need was, what we were experiencing. We set up a meeting, they came out and I shared with them and, and told them the story about the mom who, were, who was using the clothesline. And so it was truly a blessing to have Feel the Church to supply that dryer for us. That was in the mid the midst of summer. Families were washing more clothes. Hey guys, I am so pumped about this morning. Probably most of all, because you're finally going to hear a real preacher. This Sunday, you're going to have Pastor Mike Wyrick, the South Oaks campus pastor, who's going to bring the word of God and challenge us. And it is going to be a moving experience where God speaks to you. So I pray that right now you're preparing your heart. I, I want you right now just to go ahead and utter a prayer. God, help me receive your word today. Speak to me today. Because when you ask him, he will. Now, there's a few things you got to do to get ready for this morning's service. First thing you got to do is you got to let the world know that you're tuning in. Because right now, however long we get to do this thing where we're doing virtual services and able to worship in our homes, we have an unprecedented opportunity to invite other people to join us with worship. People who would never set foot in a church building, they're going to tune in if you'll just invite them. So get as specific as you can, throw it out there, cast a wide net, and then text people that you know, direct message to people that you know and say, hey, right now it's time, get ready, be involved. Take a picture of you and your family in front of your TV if you're by yourself with your animal right there in front of your TV or your laptop or your phone, wherever you're tuning in from, and let the world know that you're going to worship your God no matter what. Second thing I would love for you to do is in the comments, if you're on YouTube or on Facebook watching this, I want, I want you to uh, let us know where you're watching from. 
what we're discovering is that this is getting further and further out. People are tuning in from all over the globe. So we would love to know where you're tuning in from. So just take a moment right now and just in the comments, let us know where you're tuning in from so we can shout out to you and thank you for being a part of this. Even if a whole bunch of you right here in the DFW area, praise the Lord, let us know where you are. Don't give us your specific address, but just let us know what city you're coming from. We would love to be a part of that. Another thing I want to encourage you to do is we're going to take the Lord's Supper at the end of this service. So make sure that you take a moment to get your supplies ready, get the the bread and the fruit of the vine and have those two elements together for as many people as are believers in your home. Remember, the Lord's Supper is only for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. So those who are believers, get that ready for that amount of people. And it's going to be a great way for us to remember the gospel of Jesus together and for you to get to experience that. Now, here's, here's what I'm asking for, guys. I'm praying that God would do something in your heart and in your soul. And if he does, don't be afraid to interact. Don't be afraid to comment. Don't be afraid to go to our website and fill out the, the forms that God is going to stir your heart to fill out. If he calls you to, to do something bold today, be willing. This is not a TV program. This is a worship service. You are worshiping the King. He is with you. Prepare your heart for it. And I cannot wait to be joining with you in worship with my family, singing our praises to God. Let's start in a little bit. God bless you guys. I'm Anthony Murray. Me and my wife, uh, Sarah, have been members at Fiddler Church for about two years. I've had a feeling or... Um, something on my heart about a Seattle trip um, before I knew about the Tacoma trip. Um, And so when I saw uh, that as an option for a mission trip, I was wondering if that's where God was leading me. And I was a little hesitant because I have a lot of doubt in my own faith that I'm capable to spread the gospel. I just asked God to, you know, to use me to, you know, even if it was just with my love for people. So from what I could gather when I got there right away was that the Pathway was a group of people that was really on fire for spreading the Word of God and making it a a community action, um, really getting involved locally with the people that are living in the Tacoma area. So the Pathway uh, had our mission team dedicated to a particular neighborhood where we were out um, prayer saturating and walking the neighborhood and praying for the people of Tacoma in that area. Um, After the prayer saturation, we would go to Jefferson Park and have a cookout. And Anthony had the opportunity to meet Yvette, which then he introduced me to her. I got asking her questions, you know, about um, her family, her children, She really has no one to help her except a close friend and a cousin. My heart just broke for the situation. And if you knew the old Sarah, you would know that um, Sarah doesn't care. Sarah is like, get over it, you know? And Yvette shared her story and my heart broke. So I felt that uh, Fielder was able to help bless um, the pathway by bringing out people that were excited and fired up about um, their love for Christ and in return we received a huge blessing from just being able to um, have relationships built between their church and our church. Blessing her blessed us and you could tell it in every person's heart and eyes from the fielder group that we were just blessed by meeting Yvette and her children. Um, This mission trip was huge for me. It was something that um, I feel like I've been waiting for and waiting for and and, uh, it finally came to happen and uh, it really got me excited and I got to really see for the first time God really at work, um, making changes in people's life and actually watching things unfold and, and knowing His hand is involved in it. So if you're thinking about going on a mission, I highly recommend that you pray about it and and really ask God to show you where He wants you and what He wants of you, and and He'll definitely show you as He showed me. And uh, He opened so so much for me to see out there and, and just transformed me as a Christian. Well, 
Filder Church, here we are again, worshiping together. Now, I know we're all over the place in different locations, but we are united by one spirit, that of Jesus Christ. Now, the songs that we're going to sing today together in worship, these are songs for our God and about our God. Because when we see God for who He is, we're reminded and encouraged of who we are, sons and daughters of Almighty God. Now, where you are at home, no matter where that may be, I want to invite you, if you're physically able, to stand to your feet, clap your hands, sing out loud, dance, kneel, express your goodness and your love for the King. So let's enjoy the Lord right now. Come on. We're going to start off by putting our hands together.
take that in and take it in. The enemy has no power over you, over our God. The enemy is defeated. So to that, would you just say yes and amen? Well, we want to encourage you with this another song, The Promises of God. We just want to sing this over you. So before you start singing out loud, would you just listen and allow these words to minister to you at this time? I believe the Lord wants to minister to you. We sing and bless his name, but he wants to sing to you.
don't know this. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. No. Today we get to declare who our God is. He is the God of the impossible. He is the God who says, I see you, I know what your needs are, and I'm here for you. He's the God who says, I'm going to bless you so you can live for my glory. It won't always be easy, but I'll be with you. Trust me. He makes a way when there is no way because he keeps his promises. That's the God that we serve. Man, I'm so glad that you decided to be with us, to tune in, to worship with us this morning. It's such an incredible morning. Now, I don't know how it's going for you right now, but I can look into my home right now, and I know exactly what's going on. Georgia and Jovi are dancing around in the front down there, just partying away. We got some moody teenagers sitting on the couch right now. You guys need to stand up right now, every single one of you. This is a time for us to stand up and worship the King because he is worthy of our worship. Now, maybe that's not what's going on in your home, and I'm probably going to get some heat from my own kids for saying that, but maybe it is what's going on in your home. This worship is so different than anything we ever expected or experienced before because we used to get to gather together. Now we're doing it at home, but praise God, we are able to deliver this to you so we as the church could not let anything stop us from worshiping our King. Now I want to do a shout out for those of you who are part of Fielder Church, the South Oaks campus. You have a special treat, the South Oaks campus. Your campus, Pastor Mike Wyrick, is going to be delivering the word a little bit later on today, and you're going to be blessed from it. Also want to shout out to the Pioneer Campus and the Grand Prairie Campus. Love the fact that we're still able to be the church even when we can't gather together. But I also know every single Sunday God is extending the ministry of our church and there are more and more of you tuning in for the very first time. We are so grateful you chose to be a part of this worship service with us. We would love to know that you're tuned in and a part of this. We want to connect with you because we want to know how we can serve you and how we can bless you. And I know that right now many of you need that, that blessing. And so please do me a great favor. If you wouldn't mind texting the word next step, just as one word, to 94253, or you can go to filler.org slash next step. And you can just let us know that you're watching so that we can reach out to you. We want to send you a small little gift welcoming you to to this, the church ministry and what we're doing. So please take a moment to let us know what God is up to in your life and how we can serve you. Now, in this part of the service, every single week, if you're a guest, I want you to know we take up an offering so that the church can continue to do the ministry because right now the church is more needed than ever before to, be, to bring a message of hope and to bring a, a hand of healing and help to those around us. And so for those of you who are part of Fielder Church, I want to encourage you, if you haven't yet gotten the app, text the word Fielder to 77977 and you can get the app and that's where you can make your donations and give your normal giving. And I want to praise the Lord for those of you who have been giving faithfully, not knowing what the future holds, saying, God, I trust you. But listen, I, I know 
Every Sunday there are people who are watching this and, and maybe you just now lost your job. Maybe you just ran out of the money you had in your bank account. You don't know how you're gonna pay your bills and you're wondering where's your help gonna come from? Well, God's gonna provide for you. He'll do it in many different ways and maybe the way he wants to provide for you is through our church. And so if you have a need, Whatever that need may be, we would love to know that you have a need. So you can go to that same number, 94253, and you can text the word need and let us know that you have a need. And if there's any way we can meet that need, we'll try to do so in the name of Jesus. Now, let us know, please. And I know sometimes it takes us uh, swallowing our pride and saying, I'm willing to reach out in my time of need. But if Jesus can be your need meter through our church, then we would be blessed for it. So please let us know if you have that need. Now, I'm going to pray for us. And we're going to give our tithes and our offerings and we're going to worship the Lord because today is a day of celebration for no other reason than he is still alive. Let's pray together. God, thank you that today we get to stand up wherever we are and we get to raise our hands and worship to you. and We get to declare that you are almighty God and you are on your throne and we trust in you. And God, I pray that you would feel us today. You would fill us with your spirit. You would fill us with your presence, God. And that we would, if we could just close our eyes, we could imagine we are with the saints worshiping you today. God, be real to us because you are a real God. And we want to serve you with a sincere faith. Help us to do so. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. The highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free. you would call us your own. So we stand and sit and we love and we enjoy you because of your grace and your mercy and above all your love for us. 
So now prepare our hearts to receive the message that you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, thank you, Reggie and worship team every week. We have incredible, incredible worship. Can you believe it's been six weeks since we gathered together at our campuses and were able to worship the Lord in person? I don't know about you, but this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, this, this has been some of the most unusual and some of the most difficult times I've ever been through. But it is in times like this that I believe God wants to speak. It's the wilderness of life that is when God seems to speak the loudest. Uh, this, this is something I've learned, and it's in the God's Word, that it's in the wilderness His voice seems to be the loudest. And you want to know why? It's because all the distractions of life have been stripped away. Those things that fill up our lives, those things that just seem to weigh us down, those things that we cling to more than God just seem to be gone away right now, don't they, in COVID-19. And I believe as you've heard Jason say on many occasions, God doesn't waste a pandemic. Listen, God wants to speak to us today. And, and today, that's what I want to talk to you about. Lessons in the wilderness. You know, you can see in the Bible all throughout the Old Testament and the New, you'll see how God speaks really clearly in the wilderness. And so would you turn with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy 8, the fifth book in the Bible in the Old Testament. Turn to chapter 8 and while you're turning there, I want to give you a little context about this scripture. You see, the Israelite people, they were in captivity for 400 years in Egypt, enslaved there, making bricks for the Pharaoh and for all of his building projects. But God raised up a man named Moses. And he sent Moses to Pharaoh and he said, I want you to let my people go. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened every time and, and he wouldn't let the people go. And he said, no, but God sent those 10 plagues, if you remember. And finally, Pharaoh's heart was broken and he let them go. But then he recanted as they, as they left and that they were camping on the shores of the Red Sea. Pharaoh started coming upon them. And you remember that story. You've seen it in movies. You've read it out of God's book. Moses lifted up his arms and lifted up his staff and, and the seas were parted and God's children went across dry land. And as Pharaoh and his armies came behind him, the waters came in and once and for all, the enemies of the Israelite people were destroyed. And here they were on the other side of the Red Sea. And finally, they were free. Finally, they could go to the promised land that God had told them about for century after century. But you see, there was a problem. They had a wilderness they had to go through. It was only 250 miles. It should have only taken about a month or a month and a half to get there. But you know how long it took them? 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And you see why? Why would God let them wander so long? Well, I believe it's because there were lessons to be learned. There were things that God had to teach them before they entered into a land of abundance. And now here at this eighth chapter of Deuteronomy, we, we find the Israelite children on the banks of the Jordan River. And on the other side of the Jordan is the promised land and they're about to go into this land of abundance, this land of plenty. And Moses gathers them together and he says, I need to speak to you people because I need to tell you and remind you about the commands of God. I need to remind you of the lessons that we learned back in the wilderness. So he gathers his people together and Moses speaks to them. And here, we're going to read it together in chapter 8 of Deuteronomy. Let's begin at verse 1. The whole commandment that I command you today... You shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord God swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you, so that you might know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and he 
let you hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your, your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. It's again in the wilderness that God's going to speak to his children here. It's in that time of wilderness that they experienced the lessons of God. And right here, there are three different lessons that I want us to learn this morning from the text that we're going to be reading. And the first one is this. It's in the wilderness you'll learn what's really in your heart. In the wilderness, you'll learn what's really in your heart. You read it there in the second verse. It says that God was saying that he brought you into the wilderness these 40 years to humble you and to test you so that you might know what's in your heart. Gosh, during these times of the COVID-19 wilderness, we've discovered what's been in the hearts of people all along, haven't we? You and I have seen people arguing over toilet paper. We've seen people storing up for themselves resources and hoarding resources that others need. We've seen families that have been cooped together because of the shelter-in-place order, and, and we've seen them to begin to fight and bicker, and, and we've even seen domestic violence rise, and we've seen children be harmed because of anger and because of frustration that's in the heart of so many. Gosh, we've even seen people become hopeless and, and so fearful because they don't know what tomorrow holds. They've lost their jobs and they don't know how they're going to make it tomorrow. And they've become so hopeless, in fact, that we've been seeing, and I read this morning in the paper, how those who have taken their lives because of hopelessness is rising at an unprecedented level. Yeah, we've seen what's in the heart of some, but at the same time, I've seen the good in mankind as well and the good in humanity I've seen people sacrifice precious provisions for others because they didn't have enough. I, I've seen our own church members leave the safety of their homes and then they'd go out onto a, a parking lot, a hot parking lot, and put together food and assemble baskets of food and sacks of food and put it in the trunks in the back seats of cars of people who need food. I've watched first responders. I, I've seen nurses. I've seen doctors not even care about their own health, but instead rush to those who are sick and those who are dying. You see, in the wilderness, in the press of the wilderness, whenever everything's been stripped away, God's saying, I want to test you. I want to humble you. I want to see what's in your heart. What's in your heart this morning? In this COVID-19 wilderness, are you discovering selfishness, fear, hopelessness? Or have you discovered that God is on his throne? Have you discovered that God is sitting on the throne of your life and because the Holy Spirit is within you through faith in Jesus Christ that you found yourself being more gracious, more generous than you normally are? You found yourself trusting in God instead of being fearful and having no hope. Instead, you have a hope in Christ. What has the wilderness taught you about your heart? But then there's a second lesson that I think that God wants to show us in this text this morning. Let's look at verse 11 together. It says this, take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built houses and, and live in them. And when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and your gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied then your heart will be lifted up, but you'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You know, this must have been an interesting word for the Israelite people. I mean, here's Moses talking about houses and a lot of cattle and sheep and bank accounts full of silver and of gold. They never knew any of that. My goodness, they'd been in the wilderness for 40 years and before that in, in captivity and slavery in Egypt. They never knew what it meant to have full stomachs or houses or lands or gold. So why in the world would Moses say, be careful when you go into the promised land and you have abundance, don't forget God. I'll tell you why I think he said it. 
Because Moses knew that just like the Israelite people and just like you and me, we have broken hearts. We're sinful people. We have dark hearts. And because of that, I want you to know that in the times of abundance, we'll forget God. In fact, when I read this, I, I think about the United States of America. I think how God has blessed us with all this abundance. And arguably, the United States is probably the most wealthy nation in all the world. And we have been blessed so much by God. And yet, instead of thinking about how good God is in his abundance, what have we done in America? We've forgotten God. We've, we've neglected God. We no longer follow his commandments. You see, even children of God who do love him, we have a tendency to have this same sinful nature, and it's this. One of the things you'll discover in the wilderness is this truth. In the wilderness, you'll discover whether you love the gift more than the gift giver. You'll discover if you love the gift more than the gift giver. That's what's happened in America. We've made idols out of God's gifts. We've made idols, and an idol is anything that you value or you trust in more than God. I want you to know God, God's not upset that we love his gifts. The Bible tells us in James uh, 21.1, or I think that's it, James, in the book of James, it says this, 1.12, I think it is. James says this, all perfect, all good and perfect gifts flow down from the Father of lights. Listen, God gives good gifts. You can't separate the gifts of God from God himself, but you can displace God. You can make the gods more important, the gifts of God more important than God himself. Listen, we were made. God made us to joy and delight in him. That's why he gave us the gifts, so we would joy and delight in him, so that we would know how much he loves us and how much he wants us to love him. You see, all secondary gifts, all the gifts he gave us, all secondary joys are derivative in nature. They all flow down from God. Why are flowers beautiful? Well, because God is beautiful. Why are puppies delightful? Because God's delightful. Why is a sunset and a rainbow stunning? Because God is stunning. Why are relationships so meaningful and so fulfilling? Because God himself exists in an infinite, meaningful relation of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Why are sports fun? Because God is fun. Why in the world is work re rewarding? Because God is the rewarder of everything in our lives. You can't separate the two, but you can certainly confuse where your joy comes from. Could I illustrate it this way? I have three grandkids. I love them to death. Their names are Cooper and Sutton and Mary Caroline. Now, Cooper and Mary Caroline, you got to know, they love Christmas. They love getting gifts. And by the way, Pops and Grams love giving gifts. In fact, my wife, she loved Christmas Day more than anything else. And I will tell you, she started in August getting ready for Christmas, and she would get three different boxes, one for Cooper, one for Sutton, and one for Mary Caroline. And she would begin to pick out perfect gifts for each one of them, and she'd store them up all the way from August all the way up to December. She made it perfect, but you need to know that my wife passed away in November, and in August she was battling cancer. So it was left up to me to do Christmas, and I, I wasn't even able to think about it until the week before Christmas. Now, I can't be as good as my wife in planning, but I'll tell you what I can be. I can be extravagant. I can spend some money on my grandkids, and I love to do that. So I called up my daughter-in-law. I called Molly, and I said, Molly, tell me what it is that Mary Caroline wants the very most in life. What is it she really wants? I want to give her that this Christmas. And she said, well, it's a hoverboard. And I said, all right, show me the one. She said, well, it's kind of expensive. It said, money's no object. I want to give it to Mary Caroline. And so I bought her this very pretty and very girly, if I might say, she's all girl, hoverboard with matching helmet and matching arm pads. And then I called Nicole, my, my other daughter-in-law, and I said, what is it that Cooper and Sutton want so much? And, and they said, well, they really wanted bikes, Mike, but I know this has been a, no, 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 listen, I want to give them gifts. I want them to know that their grams and pops love them. And so I couldn't wait for Christmas morning. 
And when they opened those bikes and they opened that hoverboard, they were so excited. And I was si excited that I got to give them those gifts. And you know what they did immediately after they looked at them? They ran and they hugged me and they put their arms around me and said, oh, thank you, Pops. Thank you. We've always wanted a bicycle. Thank you, Pops. I've always wanted a hoverboard. But let me tell you what blessed me the most. Right after we had opened all the presents, Cooper looked at me, Sutton looked at me and said, Pops, would you come outside? Would you teach us how to ride the bikes? Would you, would you get out here and show us how to do this? And, and Mary Caroline said, Pops, could we go out and ride on the hoverboard? And I said, absolutely. And we spent glorious, glorious time together. And they found their delight in hanging out with their pops and with the gifts I'd given them. You see, gifts are meant for us to delight, enjoy the Lord and his presence. And I want you to know, that it blessed my heart. Just imagine how much it blesses the heart of the Father. Listen, you'll know if you love the gift more than the gift giver. Here's a simple test for you, one quick word. Can you say in your heart, I would rather be in the wilderness with God than be in the promised land without God? You'll know if you love the gift more than the gift giver. But there's one other thing I think we should learn this morning and let us finish up our text in verse 15. It says, who, meaning God, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know that he might humble you and test you to do good in the end, beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand had given me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, that he swore to his fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and you go after gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish." You know what the final thing that I think we should learn from the text this morning is this. It's in the wilderness that you'll either become desperate or you'll become self-dependent. You see, in desperation, that's where God speaks. I want you to know that God will meet all your needs. It isn't that he, he won't take away our wants sometimes so that we can become desperate and to seek after him. I believe that's what's going on right now in the COVID-19. He's taken away all of our wants, but he will meet all of your needs, it says in Philippians, according to his riches in Christ Jesus. He will, as David said, he said, I've been young, I've been old, I've never seen God's children, uh, God's righteous forsaken, or his children begging for bread. God will meet all of your needs, but he does let you go through times of desperation. And let me tell you why because God wants you to draw close to him in your desperation. Could I, could I just share just a personal story with you about my own personal wilderness? Uh, it's not COVID-19, it's exacerbated a little bit because of COVID-19. You see, on November the 23rd, I experienced a day with the most joy I'd ever experienced and a day with the most sorrow I'd ever experienced. You see, on November 23rd, my one and only little girl, got married. From the day she was born, I had dreamed about walking her down the aisle. And that day in Houston, Texas, I got to walk my precious little girl down the aisle and give her to the man that I'd been praying for since the day she was born, Greg Turner. I not only got to walk her down the aisle and give her away, I got to officiate the wedding and I got to have dances with her. I got to rejoice with her and have a party. But there was something missing that day. It was the mother of the bride. Uh, you see, my wife couldn't come because like I told you in August, she was diagnosed with cancer and fought in a courageous but very fast battle with cancer. And after we waved goodbye to Meredith and after she headed off onto her honeymoon, I called home just to see how Linda was doing. They had FaceTimed the whole wedding for her. And my brother had been holding up this camera the whole time. And they said that she would smile from time to time, even though she was battling to hold on to life. 
When I called home, Shelly, my sister-in-law, picked up the phone. I said, how's Linda? And she said, oh, Mike. Uh, she said, oh, Mike, Linda's gone to be with the Lord. And at that moment, the greatest day of joy turned into my greatest sorrow. And I began to go through a wilderness journey of my own. You see, I, I'd never experienced loneliness like this. Linda and I got married when we were 19 years old, and for 46 years we had been together, just she and I and our children, and I'd never known loneliness. I'd never known grief like this, and I was going through that wilderness. At first it was okay because my brother John and Shelly stayed with me for a couple of weeks, and somehow when the emotions would come, they were there to soothe me. I, I had my church family after they went home and every Sunday, if I could just make it to Sunday, I could look forward to the hugs of the folks at the South Oaks campus and the people of the Fielder Church wrote me letters and gave me meals and they loved on me. Listen, I don't know how people make it through without the family of God. I surely wouldn't. But six weeks ago, I was sitting in front of that television and the amazing worship service was going on, but I felt so alone I didn't have my church family. I didn't have my brother and my sister-in-law. I didn't have my wife of 46 years. And here I am sitting in this empty house that used to be a home. And I just was broken. I was desperate before God. I said, oh God, I can't do this. I can't do this aloneness. I know I'm supposed to be a pastor. I know I'm supposed to show strength and faith, but I can't do it anymore. And I began to just break down and cry. And so oftentimes when when I feel alone or when I feel burdened, I just get in my truck and drive around the country and that's what I began to do. And it was there that God spoke to me. I drove around for five hours. But in that last hour, he began to say, Mike, I want you to remember something. Do you remember those fasting times where you and Jason and the lead team went to the mountain and all you took was just water? You just took water and the word of God and you went and you met with me you remember those hunger pains would come? You remember how you were longing for something you couldn't have, which was food? Do you remember I was with you? And you could channel that pain and do something different with that pain. You could recontextualize that pain and you could make us an intimate time with me, a time where you were thankful, a time when you found the word of God. And I want you to know, I began to apply the rule and the principle of fasting to my grief because God told me to do that. Then all of a sudden, when I couldn't have what I wanted so much, my precious wife, I, I began to thank God and say, oh God, the reason this hurts so much is because your gift was so good. You gave me this amazing, amazing woman who loved me and served me and I loved her and served her for 46 years. Who gets that? I, I didn't deserve that. A good God gave me that. And so I began to thank him and I began to open up his words in those times when, when I was so alone and the words of scripture just jumped off the page to me and God was so intimate with me and he began to feel that need and it still hurts. I'm still in the wilderness, but what I've discovered is this. God said to me one more thing. He said, Mike, you do realize that you've never been more positioned to be used by me. Your brokenness your dependence on me, your desperateness for me, I can use. You do get it, don't you, Mike? You have no one to protect. You have no one to provide for. I can use you for my glory. And God began to use me in amazing ways to meet the needs of others, to use me in wonderful ways, to be in the most difficult of times where people had lost loved ones, where they'd lost little babies right at birth, times when there was financial need, and God began to bless me to meet financial needs. Listen, it's in our desperation that we find God, maybe for the first time, or maybe how he wants to use us. And I've discovered in my life, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It feels like at times I have more investment in heaven than I do here. But what I know is this, oh God, if you're going to leave me here, I am desperate to know you and I am desperate to be used by you. What about you? What is the wilderness teaching you? What have you discovered in your heart? Does the Holy Spirit reside in your heart? 
so that you're learning to be generous and selfless instead of selfish? Have you learned to love the gift giver instead of the gifts? Can you say, I would rather, Lord, be in the wilderness with you than in the promised land with all of its abundance without you? And have you become desperate for God? Has COVID-19 made you desperate? Are you crying out now, oh God, I can't do this. I'm a sinner and I need you. Listen, God's ears are attuned to the desperate. His, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit for they shall see God. He said, he abhors or he rejects the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And today, maybe for the first time, you would say, oh Lord, come into my heart because I know you went through the greatest wilderness when you stepped on the cross for me. You made yourself nothing for me. Today, would you pray a prayer that receive Christ into your life? And then would you let us know by just texting the word next step to 94253. Next step, or go to fielder.org, next step. But maybe you have questions about the wilderness. Maybe you don't even know what's going on in your life. Listen, I'd love to respond to you. All you have to do is email me and I'll answer your questions. I'll pray with you. Just email me at questions at fielder.org and I'd love to reach out to you. Listen, what are you learning in the wilderness? Are you listening to God? Are you learning lessons during this wilderness that we're going through? Let me pray for you. And then we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together because I know of nothing better than the Lord's Supper to remind us of how much God loves us and how much he sacrificed for us so that we could have a relationship with him. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, if I'm honest with you, I'd have to tell you I don't like the wilderness, but I'm learning to embrace it because, God, you're there. And because you speak in the wilderness, oh God, would you speak to me? Would you speak to every one of us during this season? Father, would we not forget about you? Would we allow your voice to speak to us? God, make us desperate for you so that we can cry out to you and you can take us by the hand and lead us to the promised land. Father, we love you. We love your gifts, but we love you more. Thank you for who you are in doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As you prepare those elements, we wanna ask that you just hold on to those elements. Our lead pastor, Jason, will come and lead us through the Lord's Supper together. But in this time, while Juan is going to get the elements, we wanna invite the rest of you to worship with us. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here. Light in the 
darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. 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 that together. times when you take the Lord's Supper and you remember the, the heaviness of it, the weight of pain. Guys, you know how much I love Mike Wyrick, my dear brother. This journey has been hard on so many people because someone we love isn't with us and we know there's a wilderness and our hearts break. But let me tell you what I know. I know these elements represent the greatest wilderness of all. As much as we could love another human being, for the brief time we're on earth, there is a father who had a son for all eternity. And since there came a moment he's on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the wilderness. And it says Jesus was willing to go to that wilderness for you and for me. That's how much he loves us. I want you to take the bread. I want you to pass it to your family. If you're by yourself, I want you to take it. I want you to think about the magnitude of the love of Christ for you. Let's do this in remembrance of him. I want you to take the cup. I hope you're able to get the fruit of the vine and just look at it and think about the the blood of Jesus. And to know the Father is looking down upon His Son, watching Him bleed, knowing He could stop it at any moment. But He doesn't stop it. Because though He loves His Son, He loves you and me too, and He knows that that blood will save us. We know what this blood represents. Let's take this in remembrance of the blood of Christ given for us. Oh God, thank you for the promise of the body and the blood of Christ that saves us from all sin. We receive your love today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
God, pray the Lord spoke to you. I know there are some of you right now who are going, I, I need to respond to this. The Lord is moving my heart. Like you heard Pastor Mike say, if today you're saying, I got to receive that kind of love on my own, I want to trust in Christ, you let us know because a journey is beginning today in your heart and we want to partner with you. Go to, to 94253, text the word next step or go to filler.org slash next step and let us know so we can partner with you. Don't waste this moment. Don't waste what God is doing in your heart right now. Take that step of faith. I also want to say just a couple more things before I pray over this and send you guys out. First, I want you to know this uh, next week is supposed to be our Serve the City. Those of you who are part of Fielder Church know that we, a couple times a year, we stop our normal gathering on a Sunday morning so that we can go out into the community and serve the city and let that be our worship. It's an incredible way that we get to testify to the grace of God to us and to others. But we're not going to be able to do that right now because of where we're at with the shelter in place. But that still doesn't mean we cannot bless others. So here's what we're going to ask you to do. There are some local heroes all around us right now that need our love and attention. And so we're going to take a campaign to show them the love and attention they deserve. And here's how it's going to work. We're going to ask you over the next week to get your phone out and make a simple little 20 second or less video where you're telling the people who are the, the first responders, the, the police, the, the fire department, those who still have to go on the front lines in dangerous places, the medical workers and nurses, those who are having to work at restaurants and grocery stores who are putting themselves in danger to provide us what we need, those essential workers, these local heroes. We wanna tell them how much they matter. And so I want you to, to take your phone, record a quick video, and you can upload that specifically to a site where we're going to compile this. You can go to fielder.org slash heroes. And when you go to that site, you can upload a quick little video. You can record it early. You can take a picture with a card that you've made for them, whatever you need to do. But uh, I want you to go ahead and, and do that. Take that step. And we, we hope we get thousands and thousands of these to let these people know how loved they are. So between now and next week, this is going to be our way to serve the city as we lift up these heroes that are among us. One last thing I want to tell you, we're going to begin the week after that, a brand new sermon series called Timothy. We're looking at First and Second Timothy and the mystery of holiness. We're going to dig into our Bible, so come prepared with pen, spiral, get ready to be fed from God's Word as we go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. It's going to be a great journey. And my prayer is that over that sermon series, we're going to be able to gather back together again as a church when God would open up that door for us. I pray you were blessed. I pray God spoke to you. I'm going to pray over you. And if you've been a part of Fielder, you know that even though you're at home, you're not dismissed. Church isn't over. You are sent to find new ways to be gospel presence wherever you are. Let me pray over you guys. God, thank you for today. It's been glorious. Thank you that we get to worship you and celebrate even wilderness because we know that you speak in the middle of it. We love you and we give ourselves to you. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. Fielder Church, you are sent.